Hey, John. Gideon says hello. Oh, yeah, tell him I'll Okay, I hello. will. Oh. <laughs> hey, you're friends? Mutual uh, friends? A friend of my son's. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's always good to see you. We've spoken many times over the years. Yes. And one of the things I like about you is just, just how passionately you burn. You know, you're an incandescent talker, whether it's about um, uh, the arts or whether it's about a humanitarian cause or crisis that you think people should know about or a way that we can love each other in a different mm. way. But I recently found out you've got a passion I knew nothing about. And uh, it's... You're a model railroad enthusiast. I am. Is, yeah. this, is this something that you discovered with your... Some Lionel fans are out there, there tonight. Go. Is this something that you discovered with your own family? Or, like, it was a childhood thing? What yeah. is this? My dad and... Uh, 1960, when I was eight years old, uh, he really bought it for himself, but he, he bought us uh, the first set, of sure. which I have every train, every car no. from that set. Every one of them works to this day. You didn't break these trains as an eight-year-old? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, my favorite one, my favorite train, is I had a layout in the basement on the south side of Chicago, and I was coming around the hill. It's 727 is the locomotive. And I was coming around the hill too fast, and I busted one of the little green lights, and I leave it busted and unrepaired because it reminds me of my childhood. Wow. Wow, a broken green light reminds it's all it you takes of your help. childhood. <laughs> look, That's for the opening... look for it anywhere in your lives, a little broken green light. <laughs> That's the opening the right... of a Dostoevsky novel, oh. the one broken green light. Um, now, uh, obviously, everybody knows and loves your portrayal of Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. Thank you. I assume... I assume, I think of one time you were on, I asked you to do it. Do, do people still ask you to recite the, the famous line, you know? Every day of my life. <laughs> Somebody stops you and so, says, so, you and, and I have to say, every, and I mean this in all sincerity, when people ask me to do it, because it sort of became the wizard, one of the Wizard of Odds of, of my generation, yeah. our, and then several generations, I, I literally can't get over that I got to be the guy that they're talking about. <laughs> Even when you ask me now, I go like, I, I, I'm the guy. <laughs> so, and have you? What's the last time you watched it? Do you, do you? Do you? Are you like the last time I saw it? Any part of it? I was in a gym in Philadelphia, getting ready to go on stage uh, with my dear friend Patty Lapone in a concert that we were doing, yeah. and uh, I saw a little clip of it, and then uh, it was no sound because I was running through the concert, and then I went upstairs to my hotel room to eat dinner. My wife had it on the TV, and I saw the very last scene. That I was 34, I think, when I shot it. So I, re I said it. I made. I said those lines, but I didn't remember a, a specific specific line and, and what it meant to me at 55-ish that what it meant at 34. And, uh, you know, the famous line that everybody knows and, and quotes, no one quotes this other line that knocked me out and I thought it was the most extraordinary gift that William Goldman gave all of us. And, uh, and I've since asked Senator Ted Cruz to consider the line because he goes around campaigning, loves the movie, knows it's a family movie, quotes every line, but he leaves this line out. And it might do him some good to consider this line, given that it's the polar opposite of half of his modus operandi. And the line <laughs> is, you know, I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, I do not know what to do with the rest of my life. I have been in the revenge business. And, and I, 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 just, I just ask us all to consider what that means. I have been in the revenge business so long, now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. People are so consumed with revenge, getting back, yeah. killing. For what? Once you get revenge, does it make your life better? No. So what would you do with that energy? I'd, I'd watch, I'd watch Homeland. I'd watch Homeland. <laughs> called a segue in the business. In the business, you, we call that a segue. You are, you are a gifted segue artist. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, you are. Because I'm a huge fan of Homeland, and now we're in season seven. We're in season seven. It's been absolutely, it's been absolutely uh, harrowing this season. I haven't been able to. My wife and I put blankets on before we watch it because we shiver so much watching it. Yeah, yeah. Not because it's cold. Now uh, um, we had Claire. We had Claire on talking about it. She said in an interview. Showtime says it's not official, but she says next year is is the last season. Are you going to miss Saul? Uh, well, if it is the last season, nobody's called me. Nobody's told me anything about okay. that. Yeah. Uh, I I hope uh, I will never leave Saul. 
he'll be with me for the rest of my life. So, well, it, it, it doesn't matter. Is he always a, is Saul always a good guy? Saul is a moral, ethical human being who is at constant war with his memories, what he has to do. Many of the individuals, the highest up individuals in the uh, intelligence institution that I've had the privilege to meet and get to know, have literally said to me, uh, one guy in particular, I don't want to mention names, but he said, you know, I was brought up in a moral, ethical tradition, a highly moral, ethical tradition, a religious family, as many of the individuals come from that background. He said, but, but in the intelligence business, you also have to marry it with making choices to protect your country. And sometimes those are very difficult choices. And this one individual said to me the other day that he teaches young cadets, young recruits who are coming into the intelligence system, whatever part of the system they're coming into. And he says, you have to realize mistakes that we've made as an intelligence agency, like Guatemala in 54, like Iran, and the long-term effect of those mistakes and how we pay for it, that the public eventually finds out about everything. And so we have to be very careful, and it's a different world we're living in. And I was so grateful that, and my wife was grateful, and my hard left friends were grateful to hear this individual who is professorial say that we recognize our mistakes. Now, people don't get to know the good things that the uh, CIA and the intelligence community does because they're secret. And that's, okay. that's what you sign up for. You don't get pats on the back or thank yous, uh, and many people lose their lives, and there's a wall of memorial, and mm -hmm. it's a, a powerful, powerful community that have given me a great guidance and gifts, including when I do my refugee work mm -hmm. uh, with the International Rescue Committee. Oh, you actually, you, you actually have a photo here. This is you. Where are you in this? In uh, this right is here? with uh, that is with uh, Juwan, who speaks six languages. My wife said she speaks one. I barely speak one. And uh, we are in uh, in the in Vepi settlement in Uganda. 130,000 uh, refugees in that settlement. Uh, 290,000 in Bidi Bidi, uh, where we went to visit for uh, almost two weeks. And just got back a few days ago. Um, the, what is so extraordinary about the Ugandan government is they are teaching us how to behave as human beings. Well, what, do you, what do you mean? What do I mean by they, that? They, they, they... So I'd been before two other trips. One on the Balkan route, first to Lesbos in 2015. I, every time after I finish Homeland, I immediately go to be with the refugees with the International Rescue Committee. 2015, there were uh, a million people, but at the, at the beginning of shooting uh, uh, season five, uh, it was an episode in a Syrian refugee camp. And then there were 125,000 people trying to get across the Balkan route to have sanctuary in Germany. Then in, in March 2016, the EU shut the doors, uh, no options, no possibilities. These people are going from a temporary situation to a possibly permanent lifelong situation in these settlements, uh, camps, whatever you choose to call them. And so all the needs and everything are different. Uganda is the polar opposite. Uganda is a country that is about welcome, building welcome, not building walls. And they are extraordinary. We actually have to go here, but oh. thank you for sharing with the story about how the Ugandans are welcoming people. They're doing it, everything. It, it was... Can I say one other thing that's the most important thing I want to share? Of course you And you can. can edit the other stuff that you don't care about. Okay. So, <laughs> what, I want, what I want people to know, Stephen, is people say, well, I don't have a talk show, or I'm not in a TV show, or I'm not a rich guy or a newscaster or something. I, 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 you know, how, how can I make a difference? And, and I say to people, you have the most powerful thing in the world. You have a vote. And use that vote. <laughs> And, 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 and on, on every issue, whether it be the refugee issue or any issue on, on the plate in your lifespan, if you don't feel that your representatives are matching your moral, ethical nature, find people who do. And, and... <laughs> Thank you. And, 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 and those people will guide all of us into who... Uh, who uh, you know, th those people who know the people, they will, they will help you learn about them, support them, get them elected, put them in positions of power in our country and countries all over the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, man. God bless you. The season finale of Homeland airs Sunday on Showtime. Mandy Patankin, everybody. I had a